And we are back, episode six of the Talking Heels podcast. My name is Nick Delahanty. The guy to my right, or on your screen to the right, is none other than Jordan Falls. Jordan, how's it going? Good, Nick. How you doing, man? Hey, I'm great. Carolina football is back this weekend. I got to tell you, I felt a little bored last weekend without no Carolina football. Not that I didn't enjoy the other games that were on. Don't get me wrong, but, you know, there's nothing like having Carolina football on Saturdays. Not at all, and kind of felt a little – I was bored myself on Saturday. Not not a lot – well, did not find a lot of interest in the games going on. Yeah, it was kind of hard, but, you know, some of the games were really good. The duke Notre Dame game. Uh, at prime time, that was a great game, and even better that Duke lost. You know, what a way to end that one. Unfortunately, Riley Leonard goes down, and like I tweeted out after the game, that kid's a stud. I hope he's all right. You know, it doesn't seem right that Duke is having a great year, and then he goes down, and that might ultimately take them out of the ACC race if he misses an extended period of time. Yeah, that sucks for uh, Leonard. He's a great kid, great talent. I uh, hope he comes back soon. I'm sure he'll be back in time for the uh, North Carolina game on November 11th, but he can very well miss time against the Florida State team in a few weeks or even NC State that cost Duke a uh, run ACC championship. Yeah, so we'll have to wait and see how it goes, but that's something that Carolina fans obviously have to monitor. But, you know, the good thing is Carolina's 4-0. They come into this week. They're going to be taking on a Syracuse team that's 4-1. Now, you look at the numbers, and it's very similar to what you see when you compare Carolina and Syracuse. But you have to remember one thing. Syracuse's four wins are against opponents that aren't necessarily top-of-the-heap opponents. Their one loss came to Dabo Sweeney and Clemson. What's your early take on Syracuse? What do you think of this team at this point and what we know about them? Yeah, you're pretty spot on. The numbers are really close. Uh, If you just look on paper, Syracuse is 25th in the country in total offense. Sarles are 24th in the country in total offense. Just two yards per game separate them. However, uh, like you mentioned, no disrespect to Syracuse's opponents, but Colgate, Western Michigan, Army doesn't exactly uh, get you fired up on Saturday. So you should beat those teams, and props to Syracuse for doing that. But uh, they go into a stretch and, enter, and started their stretch last Saturday with this stretch of Clemson, Carolina, Florida State that really is a proof who are they. and uh, and Against Clemson, they struggled a little bit. Uh, we'll see what they put on film for the Tar Heels to take advantage of and see what they come to Chapel Hill doing. Yeah, of course. You don't want to take anything away from Syracuse's 4-1 and record. They got the job done. They did what they had to do. But the strength of schedule was definitely not there. And as you just alluded to, Clemson kind of gave Carolina a blueprint of how to go about beating this team, especially given that this game is going to be at Keenan, where Carolina's been really good. Yeah, Tarles has been really good at Keenan uh, in the Matt Brown era. Uh, aside from the two wins or two losses last year at the end of the year, I mean, they've been pretty much as good as you can hope they would be. Uh, Clemson's blueprint, from what I gathered, I watched most of the Clemson game against Syracuse, and uh, pretty much key in on Garrett Schrader. That seems to be the uh, one thing to do defensively and offensively. Uh, seemed like the Tigers took a lot of deep shots. And uh, – Something that maybe we look see Drake may do uh, Saturday. I really think that this game is going to come down to two different things. Number one, Carolina's front seven has to get pressure on Schrader, but they can't let him escape the pocket. We talked about this earlier, but you know you got to spy him. You got to keep him in that pocket. Why? Because Syracuse tends to struggle when he sits in the pocket. He's a decent passer. Nothing against him, but he's a very good runner and very difficult to bring down. He's a big boy. Like, if you watch him, he's a big quarterback. So, to take him down, he could take some hits. And in the Clemson game, you saw him take a brutal hit early on and get right back up. Shows how tough this kid is. And Mac Brown alluded to that earlier in the week. The thing for Carolina on offense, and like you said, they have to test the deep threat. Clemson took a bunch of shots. Syracuse is going to be aggressive. They're going to try to keep Drake May contained, just as Carolina is going to try to keep Garrett Schrader contained. How does Carolina respond to that? J.J. Jones, is he in for another big week? Are we going to see a big week from Nate McCollum or maybe a Kobe Pesor? I think that that's going to be the key. Can Carolina get something going down the field? Yeah, exactly. And uh, Gavin Blackwell said to return. He struggled early on in the year, but could he return and be a, a standout receiver for the Tar Heels? The big thing with Syracuse is 
uh, on paper. Of, of course, we're talking about their uh, schedule and lack of strength, but uh, they're allowing under 100 yards per game on the ground, uh, 96.4 yards per game rushing. So how does that play in Saturday? The Tarles have talked about during the bye week. They've re-emphasized uh, uh, emphasis to put, the, put on the ground game and run the football. Is that going to be able to get going Saturday? Against Minnesota, they struggled. Against Pitt, they struggled to get the ball going. So um, is it coming down to Drake? And Garrett Schrader talked about spine, and he reminds me a lot of Drake May from last year. He's second on their team in rushing, which is not ideal. You don't want your quarterback to be averaging 68 yards a game rushing, and he's actually averaging more yards per carry than their running back, which is shocking. When when you in college, when you get sacked, it counts against your rushing yards. So the fact that he's still taking some sacks and still just 25 yards behind their leading rusher is uh, a little incredible. And you have to also remember their number one receiver lost for the year. He had a season-ending injury. They haven't really found that number one guy in the passing game. And like you mentioned, it's kind of like Drake made last year where him and Elijah Green were basically neck and neck in the rush game. Yeah, uh, they don't have a number one guy that stood out receiving. They have three guys with, 200, with around 200, 250 yards receiving, but that's through five games. So you're, you're looking at three guys that are averaging 60, 65 yards a game receiving. They don't really have a standout tight end. Uh, offensively that we've seen statistically at least. Uh, they do have a transfer from Michigan that used to play quarterback that's playing tight end. Saw some trick duration against the Tigers Saturday with uh, some throwback passes. Uh, obviously that's on film, so hopefully Gene Chizik and the Carolina defense is prepared for that. But again, we really don't know. I feel like uh, this is a game you just don't know what you're getting into and the Tarles need to be ready. Hopefully the bye week has prepared them for that. Yeah, definitely. And one thing that I read earlier, and I can't remember where I read it, but so don't quote me on it. But Mac Brown gave this team a homework assignment to watch this game, the Syracuse Clemson game. So these guys had to write down things that they saw and, and observe. And Drake May was one to say, I shut the commentary off because sometimes they'll be saying something and we'll be seeing something else. And we don't want that to kind of lead us in the wrong direction. Knowing this and seeing them play in an actual game, it's good and bad because number one, you get to see what your opponent has and you get to see some of the things that Clemson did to beat them. But the other bad thing is Clemson handled them pretty well. Can the Tar Heels not sleepwalk into this game is what I'm asking. <laughs> yeah, that, that's that been a challenge. I, and we talked about before the pit game two weeks ago, we talked about it being a trap game heading into the bye week on the road Saturday night ACC road test. And I didn't feel like that was as big of a trap game because you had the bye week after. I feel like we have a true trap game situation. Even though we're coming off a bye week, we shouldn't be sleepwalk, sleepwalking on uh, Syracuse, but I feel like there's a lot of looking ahead going on, and uh, Sir, this sets up as a true trap game, in my opinion. And the Tarles cannot be sleepwalking, it needs to be all eyes on Syracuse. And how do you take advantage of their weaknesses? Um, obviously, Clemson exploited a lot of those, so being ready Saturday is the big key. And like you said, looking ahead, there's so much in the media about looking ahead, and I, I bust your chops about it because you're as passionate about UNC football as anybody that I've ever met. And that's a testament to you. But you, you were talking about how Miami might be a night game. ESPN flexed. They are able to hold it for six days. That game is going to be either 12 o'clock or 7.30. Let's face facts. Carolina beats Syracuse. They're playing that 7.30 game against Miami. They lose. That's a 12 o'clock game. So they know it. The coaches know it. The players know it. Me and you know it. The fans know it. That's hard to kind of channel out. Because when you're thinking about the bigger picture, this team thinks they can win an ACC title. They're looking ahead. Everybody's looking ahead. But it's so important that they focus in on Syracuse and take care of business in front of them. Yeah, and credit to the Tarles this year. At every time that some, anybody, the media or any fans, anytime they receive praise to this point this year, they have responded and won. And in the past, they've not been able to do that. Every time they get highly ranked the past few years, they lose a the game they shouldn't lose or – Failed to win a big game. Georgia Tech, NC State last year, after coming off winning the Coastal Division, they laid an egg. And credit to them so far, they have not done that this year. But it can't happen when you get in October. You've got through September 4-0. Coming off a of bye week, you have all the preparation, all the time to prepare for Syracuse. 
you got to take advantage. And we haven't really seen a game put together start to finish for the Tarnals yet, offensively or defensively. It'd be nice to see that Saturday. It really would be. And let's remember, they escaped against App State. They survived an early punch in the throat from Pittsburgh. You have to start to wonder, this team eventually is going to break in one of these situations. When is that ball going to drop? Let's face it. Nobody's expecting them to go undefeated. Nobody in the country is expected to go undefeated. It is a very tough thing to do in college football, and the schedule gets tougher. But can they avoid it another week and take care of a team that they should beat? Yeah, exactly. And the schedule is tough. There, There's no denying that. The ACC is a lot better than what I think people thought it would be preseason. Uh, Florida State's good. Duke is good. Obviously, Riley Leonard's case uh, probably handles that a little bit. Miami is really good. Uh, likely coming to Chapel Hill 5 and 0. They should handle business against Georgia Tech this weekend. Uh, Louisville undefeated. And Louisville has a great schedule set up for them to make the ACC championship run. They don't play Florida State, Carolina, or Clemson. So, I don't know how they avoided those three, but they did, and props to them. They've got through the early part of their schedule. So you can talk about ACC championship and look ahead. you got to take care of one game at a time. If you lose to Syracuse, it's all for nothing. Uh, it does set up nicely that you have three straight home games in Keenan. Uh, Syracuse and Virginia are two of them that are winnable and you shouldn't struggle on paper against. And then, obviously, the Miami game is going to be a tough one, but you get them at home. Uh, but you can't lose to Syracuse and then turn around and expect a great crowd against Miami. So uh, it, they can't get caught looking ahead. Uh, that's that's what it comes down to. College football is so much about momentum because when you build that momentum, your fan base follows. And the fans in Carolina are very passionate people. Let's call a spade a spade. They are. So when this team continues the success, they're going to show up. They're going to support. Like you said, they throw up a duck against Syracuse. The people are going to be like, is this team fraudulent? What's the case with this group? And you want to avoid that. You want that crowd in, against Miami to be all Carolina. We saw earlier in the year, some of those teams, and you mentioned it on the show, they travel well. Not, not that Miami travels well, but you're going to see some teams that do travel well. And you want that home field advantage when you have it, and they're set up right now nicely to have that if they continue winning. Yeah, and App State travel well to Keenan, and Minnesota travel well. We need to start turning Keenan into more of a home field advantage. Now, and I don't blame the fans as much. We, we went through a struggle the last few years of dealing with the off-the-field hype, the preseason hype before 2021. We've talked about it. And when you continue to lay eggs time and time again, eventually the fans are going to check out until you prove it on the field. This is Carolina's chance to take another step toward proving that on the field. You can't get there without being Syracuse, though. Absolutely. And one thing that's important to note about this Carolina team, George Petaway, promising young running back sophomore, intends to redshirt. That news dropped this week, as Mac Brown told the reporters. Well, how Carolina is replacing him in the, in the kick return game, I don't know if I'm very fond of it. I'm Marion Hampton and Doc Chapman. Now, Chapman I'm okay with. Give him a chance to showcase his playmaking ability. But if you're a Marion Hampton – and they're giving him a heavy load, he's the last guy I want returning kicks. Right, exactly. We've seen Hampton have a huge success in the run game, uh, especially when British Brooks went down. We just talked about the key to Saturday. One of the keys to Saturday is establishing that run game against a, what has proven to be a good run defense despite their opponents. So you got to have some kind of consistency in the backfield. Unless Carolina's plan is to fair catch every kickoff, which they did against App State, I, I don't love it, but you can always have breakouts on special teams. Special teams win games. If you have the ability to have a big kick return, you should take advantage. I think I'd rather see Elijah Hussey back there who has proven, uh, proven to be great on special teams in the punt game. So put him back for kickoffs, let him do something. Chapman I'm fine with. I don't like the Hampton move at all. I was just going to say put Elijah Hussey back there. He's explosive in, on punt returns. Why can't you give him a chance on the kick returns? And, of course, getting back to Petaway, it's kind of unfortunate because he was somebody that came into Carolina with so much promise and what he's looking for, and I don't blame him one bit. I, I want to put that on the record. He's looking for the opportunity to play. Why would you waste a year of eligibility when you're not playing? Do I think his future is in Carolina? 
I have my doubts. And as much as they want to say he he wants to stay here, he's going to go through spring ball. What's going to change from now until spring? Hampton should be back. That's going to be your lead back. They're going to bring in guys that could fill the void that British Brooks is going to leave and things like that. I don't know if I really see George Petaway suiting up for the Tar Heels again. Yeah, in the running back room, you have Caleb Hood and Elijah Green. Clearly, if they were going to stick with Petaway in the running back room, they would have never moved into the slot receiver to begin with. Uh, so they they clearly trust uh, Hood and uh, Green above Petaway. And then moving the slot receiver kind of seemed like a grasp or a reach to get him on the field at the playing time when Taz Walker's situation came about in the preseason. That just hasn't turned out. Uh, other receivers have done better. Um, Chapman is one, a uh, redshirt freshman. And uh, obviously with McCullum returning, there's the wide receiver room is crowded. The running back room is crowded. So unless we see a situation like DJ Jones where Petaway is looking to move deep as a back or something, I don't see Petaway getting on the field this year and likely not next year unless he makes significant strides. So very well to see him in the transfer portal next year. Yeah, and Petaway moving to slot receiver was an idea that at the time, you're looking at this Carolina team, you're saying, okay, they might be a little weak at receiver. No Tez Walker, McCollum was banged up. We really didn't know that until opening day, but they knew. So to see that happen, you're like, okay, it makes a ton of sense. Petaway's a playmaker, get him the ball. But he hasn't even gotten on the field in that aspect. So it's very tough to say, and, and nothing against him. I think he's very talented, but I just think that other guys have been better and have earned that opportunity. Yeah, I think that might go back to the kick return. He's been on the field for some kickoffs, but I think that's where you say it. You look there and see, oh, Hampton, we might not love it as fans. you got to think that their mindset is, Every kick also be either a touchback or we're on a fair catch it and take the ball at 25, not risk any turnovers and give Drake the ball. And that's got to be what they're thinking with Hampton on, on kickoffs. It's just have some sure hands out there that can fair catch a kickoff, don't want no buffs or anything like that, and just take the field position and get on offense. Yeah, and that's the beauty of that new rule is that you fair catch it, catch it wherever and you're good to go. Yeah, exactly. And not a lot of fans were happy with it against App State. It felt like App State was pooch punching a lot or pooch kicking a lot to uh to Caleb Hood a little bit. And we were fair catching at the 23 and could have ran for probably seven or eight yards, got to the 30, 35. It felt like you're giving up three yards essentially. Um Caleb Hood almost uh I know he had to fall down in that game to catch one of those, but um yeah, I mean if you're gonna catch the ball at 25, catch the ball at 25 and return it, but Outside of that, you're going to see a lot of fair catches. It's it's ultimately in the sec- for the safety of the players. Uh, kickoffs can be very violent. Players are running full speed and the injuries happen. So that's the ultimate reason for the rule. It's not it it, it uh, hinders explosive plays a little bit, but uh, I think that's what we'll see the Tarles do going forward. But now let me let me pinpoint this question to you, okay? If they're worried about the safety of the players, and of course, rightly so. Why not just give the ball to the team on the 25 and get rid of the kickoff? Exactly. I mean, that that would be the ultimate. Just do it. I guess they'll give an option to players to return it. It's You're saying, hey, you had the option to return it. You might get tackled at the 20 or even fair catch at the 25. It's kind of like a, you make the choice, but we're giving you a very good option. Do you want option A or option B? Um, and if you took away the kickoff, you'd have to come up with a, uh, alternative for the onside kick or surprise onside kick uh, in late game situations. So I, I think that might be what's holding them back a little bit. The way that I would do it, and I might sound crazy, but the way that I would propose it to the NCAA, and of course they're backwards, so they probably won't listen to me anyway. <laughs> if you're looking to onside kick, you must go for two when you score a touchdown. Like in the fourth quarter, if you go for two, you have the option. You have the option to do it. And of course, only the fourth quarter and only if you go for two. Because at that point, you're trying to say, you know, we need something and move it that way. Other than that, I wouldn't even consider it. I would just say, get rid of the kickoff. That's it. No, no more of that no garbage. More, and No more surprise onside kicks. No Sean, May- Sean Payton uh, onside kick to start the game. Nothing like that. Nope. Just you get the ball at the 25. That that's it. We save time. We save, save effort because who wants to see the kicker boot into the back of the end zone? The players run down the field, pumping up the crowd. They don't even touch anybody. They just run. It's a nice jog. Save them the mileage on their legs. 
and that's it. Move yeah. it forward. No more kickoffs. I love it. I love it. Um, maybe you can uh, submit a letter to the NCAA. Maybe they'll listen to you. Listen, yeah. if I just but, say I'm associated with Carolina, they'll they'll but, decline me right away. Put free Taz at the end of your letter. <laughs> I'll put it at the yeah. beginning of the letter. Can I can I write it? Yeah. Listen, can I say to the people that won't let Tez Walker play? Yeah, go for it. <laughs> okay, I'm in. You know I'm in. I will write it. Speaking of I Tez will... Walker, we found out before the show that he is uh helping on the scout team. That's got to help the defensive bats be prepared for the tough competition we've talked about coming up. I have to say this, okay? I absolutely love Tez Walker. Like, he is a guy – that has come in and has won my heart over. And here's why he could have easily taken his ball and went home and not been in sight, been out of mind and been frustrated with his situation, his mental health and everything else has been at the forefront of all the problems that surround the reason why the NCAA won't let him play. But there's this kid doing anything he can to be a part of the team and helping in any way he can. And just being around the team and being so happy. And you see people posting pictures with him in Chapel Hill. And he is just a genuinely good kid. And I hope that the NCAA looks closer into this and realizes how deep they are screwing this kid. Because he is harmless. He is a great kid. He is a great representation of what a student athlete should be. And they just continue to screw him. And I hope, I hope that it works out for this kid. because. Everything you see about him, it, it's like he is just a burst of energy and that he's so positive toward this team. And it's helping the Carolina football program in more ways than he probably even understands. Is Tez Walker the most popular Tar Heel player to ever play for Carolina that's not set well on the field? I mean, you can make the case he is. At, at this point, I mean, everybody's talking about the guy that's <laughs> not even a step foot on the field and – Turtle jersey. So uh very popular. Everybody loves him, like you said. He's doing everything he can to help the team on and off the field, clearly. Um, hopefully the NCAA uh continues to look into it. I don't think they will, but we're continuing to see day after day they're uh granting these waivers to two time transfers that have actually played at two schools, uh, for basketball and football, and it just doesn't make any sense. Uh it's it's like they're they got a vendetta against uh UNC at this point. I honestly don't think we'll ever see Tez Walker play for Carolina. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think he's going to the NFL draft. I think you, if they make a ball game and he plays in the ball game, I think that'll be the only opportunity. And the reason why is it will be a showcase for the draft. But one thing is for certain, whether he plays for Carolina or not, I will always be a fan of that kid. I I just, there's so much positive that you could put around him. And, and he just got done so dirty by the NCAA. It's incredible. Yeah, and, and to date, uh, at least to this point, he hasn't been a distraction. Me and you had talked about a few weeks ago before the pit game, we were worried that the NIL stuff might cause a distraction off the field for the locker room, and it hasn't. It's actually uplifted them, and so they're, they're turning this negative uh, action of, by the NCAA and negative energy and turning it into positive energy uh, off the field and on the field. So uh, it's kind of like a rally and cry around Tez and win for Tez type thing, and as long as they keep doing that, uh, nothing uh, bad can come of the situation. And I think it made this, the same in a bowl game. I think it made this team closer. It yeah, built a bond because one of their brothers was done dirty, and they all stood up together to support him. And whether you agree with each other or not, you're going to have instances where you fight in practice, you have arguments, you disagree with a coach, you disagree with a teammate. But at the end of the day. This brought them together, and I think it made them stronger than they were. And and that's a great thing, especially when you're trying to win football games. Yeah, exactly. The moment, that, as a team, the moment you realize you're stronger together than you are individually is the moment you become closer together on and off the field and uh, pushing your fair position to be successful. And that's what's happened here. And it's uh, it's great for the Tar Heels. It's great for the offense. It's great for the wide receivers. You've seen uh, Gavin Blackwell drops a pass or J.J. Jones drops a pass. They come over, and the first guy to meet him on the sideline is Tez Walker, picking him up. And Mac has said over and over that we need to pick Tez up and the offense, and the, the team needs to pick Tez up. The fans need to pick Tez up. Tez is picking the players up. 
his wide receiver mates and things like that. So it's great to see it work both ways. And um, it's, it's been a, it's a great story that unfortunately doesn't have a happy ending right now. But maybe it does in a bowl game or maybe the Charles make the college football playoff and gets to play there. That would be a beautiful storyline if they made the college football long way, playoff. Long way to go. A long way to go, but that would be a beautiful storyline to see him suit up in the college football playoff. The NCAA will be punching uh, the air. They'll be so mad. It will be the greatest comeback story ever. And, and for those of you that either are not uh, followed the news stories or anything like that, Taz is eligible to play after being enrolled for two semesters at his current school when he enrolled in January. So the spring semester and the fall semester ends December 6th, I believe, in Chapel Hill. So uh, unfortunately, he will not be eligible for the ACC championship game, but the bowl game he would be. And the NCAA does not recognize the summer semester as a semester. So uh, spring, fall, and then he'll be eligible for a bowl game. And Mac has said that Tez wants to play, he'll play him at a bowl game. If the Tarles are the And the NCAA should consider the summer a semester. They should, yeah. Because how many of your athletes are actually on campus that are taking classes? Look at the women's basketball program. The freshmen were enrolled in classes in the summer. I don't know if the players, if the other players were, but those student athletes, that's a semester to them. They're going to have credits before typical freshmen have credits. I don't get why they don't consider yeah. that. Basketball does it. Typically football does it. Typically all athletes take summer classes because it lightens their load in season uh, for classes. So they're still able to stay on their academic track, take classes in a school year, but it's not as many credits or as many classes that allow them to compete athletically and uh, still stay up to date in the classroom. And uh, NCAA just does stuff backwards, man. Listen, they're going to need a lighter workload when they're traveling next year to Stanford in the middle of the week for a college basketball game. And, you know. Yeah, women's soccer on Thursday night. I mean, sounds good to me. Sounds great, right? But going back to the NCAA, they released some new, how do I say, some new rules that, we want to talk about and go a little bit deeper into it. I'm going to turn it over to Jordan here because he has a list of the rules. And if I just started talking about them, I probably would just start ripping the NCAA. So I, I think we're heading in that direction anyway. <laughs> uh, so, but the, the biggest rule change is the previous uh, window for transfers for college football and uh, men's and women's basketball was a 45 day window uh, to transfer. Uh, so, or that's the new rule. The, the previous rule was 60 days. So you had two full months to transfer after the season was over. It felt like, I know we talked about it in the spring, uh, just being you, college basketball, it felt like that transfer portal was open forever. And with the Tarlos going through the transfer portal on the men's side, it just it was like, who else is transferring? We still got three weeks until it closes. So that has been reduced from 60 days to 45 days. So but now let's talk about the date that it opens. Because this is a big issue. That I, it's it's a big issue. So we're gonna talk about we'll talk about it on both sides. So let's start with college football first. College football it opens on December fourth, the day after the college football playoff teams are announced. So you still have all of bowl season to get through, and it's a thirty day window for the uh, portal in football on December fourth, thirty days. The other fifteen days to match that forty five will be in April after spring or during spring practice. So for football. You open the portal after the playoff teams are announced. All these teams to have bowl games. Playoff teams are in the playoff. You don't know what your roster turnovers will look at and look like until after those games for most teams. But the portal's open thirty days during bowl season. It should open thirty days starting the day after the national championship. And now you see why Mac Brown had his staff put together a projected depth chart of who they expect to be here because. Come December 2nd, after that ACC title game, we expect Carolina to be there, obviously. But after that date, these players could just bolt. They don't have to worry about the, the bowl game or the college football playoff. If they want to go, they could go. And you're asking these coaches to stop worrying about their game plan, to finish up their season because these players are going and leaving and you have to catch up in the transfer portal? Yeah, and, and not only uh, from the standpoint of, oh, is somebody leaving – you, we might the Tarles might not have nobody in the portal, and that'd be great. But you still have seniors graduating that you need to replace, and if you can replace them with experienced, talented guys that are in the portal, somebody from like Elijah Hussey or uh, somebody from 
Texas A&M or somewhere, and it's a big name, and you got a team that is three and nine, not in a bowl game, able to put all their resources into recruiting out of the transfer portal, while the Chargers are sitting here at ten and two, preparing for an Orange Bowl berth or whatever. You're punishing the team that has made the bowl game. Because they are not able to put all their resources into recruiting. Uh, it just doesn't make any sense on that. Uh, no, it doesn't. And then the basketball side is just as bad. Basketball. It thinks it's probably worse. This just has, buckle up, people. This is actually worse. It, it hasn't changed. The portal now opens the same time it did before, which is the day after the selection show on Monday, uh, the day after selection Sunday. And it's open for 45 days. So you got through, you got. Three and a half weeks of March Madness that 68 teams are participating in. And you can't recruit the transfer portal until your season's over. Or you could, you would just be taking away your resources from your staff from game planning and a chance to win a national championship. And now, obviously, you went through the season last year. And, and let's talk Carolina basketball a second. You knew the likes of Don Tris Styles was going to transfer. You knew the likes of DeMarco Dunn was likely out the door. Tyler Nickel, guys who didn't have an opportunity to play. But say Carolina would have made a deeper run into the tournament and these rules would have applied. And Caleb Love says, you know what, guys, I'm out of here. Now you got to scramble in the portal and figure out how you're going to replace him. Fortunately, they have Elliot Cadell. That's a big, huge bonus. But say Cadell wasn't in the mix. Now you're in a deep spot because most of those good players that entered the transfer portal are probably off the board because let's face it, there's backdoor deals going on. There's everything in it and it's mother yep. there. There's a lot of different things that take into account. So you're basically getting punished for going to the final four. Yeah, it's, it's stupid. It was like this last year. It did hurt the Tarles last year because unfortunately they didn't make the tournament. So they were able to put all the resources into that transfer portal, obviously losing guys and then replacing them. But if the Tarles make a run into March this year, they're not able to hit the portal, and you might not even know who's leaving until after your season's over. So then you're hurting the kids that are on the team because you're limiting their period of, from a 40 day, 45 day window to probably a 21-day window because it we'll, we'll use RJ Davis. If RJ Davis has finished his senior year at Carolina and decides he wants to transfer somewhere else for his last year, he's not going to do that until Carolina's season's over. So if Carolina makes a run into April, then he's going to have three weeks, two and a half weeks to transfer because the window doesn't open until the day after the national championship game. Just doesn't. It's okay, though, because R it's okay because RJ Davis, if he transfers, is going to go to Arizona with Caleb Love. <laughs> they're going to team up again. Look, they're going to recreate this photo in Arizona. Don't don't wish that on nobody. I, RJ Davis will strictly add a sample. Uh, first name that came to my mind. Do not want him to transfer. I, I just had to throw that in there because I love Caleb Love too. So, you know, I, I would have loved to have seen them play another year together. It's just a matter of making the joke. But the way it should be is they should take the day after the national championship and start the transfer portal a week from that date. Yes. Because uh -huh. then it gives everybody a chance to breathe and refresh and then you go. And then you, you as a team... You say Hubert Davis can have conversations with his guys, can get a grasp of who's going and who's not. And then you give players a chance to evaluate their options and talk to their coaches and things like that. Yeah, it, it, that would make the most sense. Unfortunately, the NCAA doesn't go by common sense. The uh the last change the, uh, the last change, they did want to make the change from 60 days to 30 days. They sell it on 45. Fine. I'm okay I, with 45. 45 is fine. 60 was too long. 45 is okay. 30 is too short, I think. I just would like to see the window, the start date change from... M me too, I agree. From December for football to after the playoff, and then from Selection Sunday to after the championship, national championship. And the last change uh, I think we all saw coming, I'm okay with this change, is that graduate transfers now have a deadline to enter, enter the portal. Uh, and it's May 1st for fall and winter sports and July 1st for spring sports. I think we all saw this coming. Uh, there's no more uh, Pete Nance transferring on July 17th. Uh, but uh, he, can, he can commit, they can, can commit at that date. They just have to at least notify that they're in the portal by May 1st. Yeah, that's a change that I'm okay with. You know, yeah. it's, it, it is what it is. But, 
You know, the grad transfers, I think, are such a good thing because they go elsewhere and they can make an impact on a team where they might not have made that impact with their former team, like Garrison Brooks. Garrison Brooks, I personally think, and I, I never talked to Garrison about it or anything like that, but I feel like Garrison thought that his time at Carolina was up and he still wanted to play and had that eligibility and found the home at Mississippi State. So those guys, I can understand giving the, the option to transfer, but I do think it's better to control it and, and make sure that there's like a timeline on it. You had the perfect opportunity to list a impactful transfer and chose Garrison Brooks. No respect, but Brady Manick is a great example. Well, Brady Manick is a great example, but I was using somebody who is leaving Carolina as a grad transfer, okay? Brady That's Manick fair. is the greatest transfer in the history of college basketball, and I'm going to put it on right there. Sorry, Cam Johnson. I love you to death, but Brady Manick was the X factor. H huge X factor. Absolutely. And you know what? Because he was such an impact, the NCAA should have gave him another year to come back. He should have had another year. If we had another year of Brady Manic, I, I totally believe last year turns out completely differently. I 100% agree. But there is another change that the NCAA made that you mentioned before we got on the air today. Uh, yeah. Um, talking about the FCS to FBS rule. Uh, well, not even that. I was talking about the uh, the visits. Oh, yeah, the visits. <laughs> well, the we can get into the FCS and the FBS, FBS if you visits. want. That's fine. Well, no, we're going to visit. The, they are not allowing recruits to take pictures on unofficial visits anymore. So no more uh, seeing players in Brooklyn football uniforms or basketball uniforms on unofficial visits. This is what and the NCAA is worried about. We're, we're focusing all of our resources on a picture, a photo op. Their, their mom can still take a picture of them, but the school cannot take a picture of a player or a recruit in a uniform. That's what they're worried about. Like, this is sickening. What are they doing? Tez can't like, play. First, like, why can't – yeah, Tez can't play, but we're going to worry about recruits taking pictures. First and foremost, if you're in that position to go on a visit, whether it's official or unofficial, God bless you because they gave you the talent to get to that point. And a school is willing to bring you in and allow you to put on their uniform, take some pictures, and be proud of what you accomplish and what you might be able to accomplish at that school, and you've taken away from these kids. I don't get it. And for some kids, that unofficial visit could lead to an official visit and lead to a commitment. So why are you punishing these kids and taking that opportunity away? It's fun. Is the NCAA afraid of fun? Uh, apparently, they're turning into the... Uh... The NFL for years has been known as a no-fun no league. Maybe that's where the uh, NCAA is trying to head. Uh, they don't have Taylor Swift, unfortunately, to help. The NFL is scripted, well. by the way. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, yeah, no more pitchers, no more. Uh, Jordan so didn't want to touch on that, guys. He knows that I'm right, so he didn't want to touch on that I'm, one. I'm not touching on that one. Uh, I was at that Jets game at MetLife Stadium on Sunday Night Football, and the Jets were robbed. That's all I'm going to say. Was you with all the Swifties? There actually really wasn't that many. There was a lot of Chiefs fans, but did there wasn't a lot of Swifties. There was more Patrick Mahomes jerseys than anything. Did you did you wear your friendship bracelet or whatever they're calling it? Heck no. The Jets gave me a friendship bracelet that lit up, and they shut the lights at the stadium, and they lit up, and they played Thunderstruck, and it made me want to run through a wall. So, yeah, that's my friendship bracelet. <laughs> All right. Got, got Nick on his high horse. So. Um, but, yeah, no more pictures with NCA. So, uh Plus, so when I take my unofficial visit to visit Hubert Davis, I can't take a picture with him. No, you cannot. That's so mean. What if I'm a Hubert Davis fan? You can. Your mom can take a picture. The school can't take a picture of you. Yeah, but I can't post it. <laughs> I think you can, if it's not by the school. I don't know. This yeah. really, it really they're gonna. They're gonna. You know, it's gonna backfire, and they're gonna blame Carolina for something like this. And it's gonna. It, watch. Give it a year. <laughs> They'll probably backtrack the rule to like. 2020 and say, hey, if you did this before, if you did it back two years ago, you're under violation. Yeah, they'll go and look at Courtney Banghart's recruits that have been on unofficial visits over the last two weeks that have taken pictures and posted them with the team. Yep, they'll be like, yep, they're bad. There you go. All right, um, let's go back to football, uh, Syracuse tradition, Saturday night. Wait, you forgot the FCS. 
You want to talk about FCS? No more transitions. Yes. From- I, I feel so bad that I cut you off from talking about oh, that, but I was just so fired up about the pictures. F- FCS to FBS transitions are uh, now uh, – the school has to pay a $5 million application fee to make the transition to FBS. That is an increase from $5,000. Uh, pretty large increase there. You want to know how dumb I am, guys, or how much I wasn't really paying attention earlier? I thought that what Jordan meant was for a player to to go in the portal and go to a, a different um, school from FCS to an FBS. They had to pay $5 million. Then I thought that in order for them to recruit players from the FCS, they had to pay $5 million. I wasn't understanding the concept of it. Now I get it. It only took me a little while. I get it now. It's okay. But a lot still, of money, you have to pay $5 million to play for the Tarles. That's what I thought you meant. I thought they were going to have to pay like $5 million. I'm like, man, Elijah Hudson is an expensive transfer. But now it makes sense. Like, obviously, with all these teams moving and whatever, the F- the NCAA wants the money. It's obvious. We, we kind of figured that. So, so It's all about the money, not the student athlete or the mental health. That's the biggest change probably will see them, uh, or as many FCS to FBS schools transitioning. So, uh, oh, They'll take all of them if they pay $5 million. A lot of a lot of transitions going on uh, and rule changes for the NCA. So, NCA rip session is over for now. For now, <laughs> we'll, we'll be back. We'll be back with more. So now, of course, I, I love this because you're taking the the lead of the transitioning into everything tonight, and I love it. It just shows that the rookies becoming the vet. It, it's a great feeling. So I'm going to throw it back to you with the next topic here. Okay. So a piece of the game, Saturday night, or Saturday afternoon in Keenan, what what you got? Okay, I'll give you three. Don't let Garrett Trader run. Don't let him get out of the pocket. Beat him with the deep throw. And then my bold prediction, Carolina runs for over 100 yards. Marion Hampton, 120 on the board. Drake May, another 65 to 70. Takes a couple of hits. I hear you say, oh, my God, Drake May, we can't take that hit. It's okay. Tar Heels going to win the game 38-21. Not even close. It's gonna be a start to finish. No, 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 no sleepwalking. Okay, here there's a trend that Carolina football has followed this year, and you guys could read about it tomorrow when I post my uh, article on keeping a heel. Week one, who scored first? Carolina scored first. Very good. Ding, yeah. ding, ding. You got that right. Week two, who scored first? Carolina, uh, did App score that first? That was it. App score. Bingo. App State scored first. Week three, who scored first? Carolina, Minnesota. Carolina, Nate McCollum touchdown. Yep. Very good. You even you even got the uh, player. Week four against Pittsburgh, who scored first? Pitt scored first. Pittsburgh scored first. So what does that mean? Carolina scored first Saturday night. <laughs> Bingo. So that means they're not sleepwalking. So I, I think that. That's going to be the trend. They're following it. I, do I love it that it would be Miami would score first? No. But we'll worry about that when the time comes. I think that they're going to come out. They're going to be fresh. They're going to be ready to go. Drake May is going to do Drake May type things. Maybe a 400 clip from him and go okay. from there. Not, I, I love the 400 clip uh, prediction for Drake. Uh, I'm going – my biggest key is going to be discipline. Stay disciplined on two things. One, like you said, containing uh, Garrett Schrader. Syracuse goes as he goes. That's been the trend. Keep him in the pocket, or if you're going to blitz six, seven guys, get him down on first contact. Don't let him escape and make a play with his legs. That, it's been a trend. Is not as much this year, but last year, Carolina would have a quarterback in their grasp, and he'd get away. When you get him, get him on the ground. Uh, contain him. He's known to run. We talked about that tonight. So I would even keep him in a spine, maybe with Power Eccles or Cedric Gray. Um Maybe even Dez Evans off the off the end a little bit. Maybe just drop him into a spy. Uh, definitely c- contain him. And the discipline on penalties. Don't commit anything stupid. Don't get in your head. Syracuse is committing eight penalties a game for an average of 78 yards a game. And the Turtles are only committing five penalties a game for 46 yards a game. That's 30 yards of field position that we can pick up on the orange. If they commit a stupid penalty, if they take a late shot on somebody, don't retaliate. Just take the 15 yards or wherever it is and go on about your day. Uh, and then you mentioned deep shots. The Tigers took a lot of them last week. It either resulted in either a completion or a DPI call, Syracuse. 
take advantage. We have the top, we have talented wide receivers, Nate McCullough, JJ Jones, Cody Pacer have all had big games this year. Take advantage of that. Establish the run game first, but take advantage of going deep and let Drake do his thing. Let Drake be Drake. Now, if I had to ask you which receiver is going to have 100 yards in this game, who do you pick? I'm going Kobe. You're going to go Kobe? Okay. Go I Kobe. can see it. You know, Kobe hasn't really been that X factor that he was early on in the year, but he's still that consistent threat. I like that. That's a sleeper pick there. I, I think everybody, lately it's been McCollum against Minnesota. It was J.J. Jones against Pitt. Uh, Kobe's not really done a lot since the App State game. And really, the South Carolina game was the biggest game of the year. I feel like everybody's trying to figure out how do we stop McCollum, how do we stop Jones. Those are the two that are on, fresh on everybody's mind. Kobe's not been it as much. What have you done for me lately? Kobe steps up Saturday night. 100 yard receiver. Uh, I'm going to throw in uh, John Copenhaver has a touchdown as well, and Carolina wins 31 20. I was just going to say something about the tight ends. Like, yeah, I think I'm, starting starting to read. I'm starting to think you're reading my mind, but it's okay. Kamari Morales scores okay. in this one. He's going to score. J.J. Jones goes for over 100 yards. But McCollum gets in that 85 to 90 range. I think they're going to have two because, obviously, Drake's going to throw for 400 yards. Everybody's going to get their turn. So I think that J.J. Jones has a couple of deep plays. He's averaging, what, 19 yards a catch. So yeah. I could see that being a big X factor, especially if you try to go down the field. And I think that McCollum has a bounce back week after really being kind of invisible against Pitt. I think your take on Drake is uh, goes right in line with, my, with both of our keys as far as taking deep shots. We thought Syracuse secondary isn't as great. I think that sets Drake up for a huge day. I still kind of worry about the run game a little bit. Uh, again, we don't know much about Syracuse as far as their quality of competition, but their paper says they're really good and really strong as the run game. Got to establish Hampton and Brooks on the ground early. Uh, no ram formation, just run the football. No ram. Just to try it straight, run the ball, and uh, hopefully a few touchdowns from them. And thirty-one twenty. Hopefully it's a lot worse than that. I would like a, I would like nothing more than a smooth selling win in the next week and five and zero. You know we're not getting a a, a non stressful weekend, so buckle up, be ready for some Carolina football. But hey, before we go, we got to talk about this. Did Carolina break Pittsburgh? Because Phil Jerkovich is now no longer the starter in Pitt. I I don't understand that. I thought Djokovic played great against Carolina. I thought Pitt was in that game until he got hurt. So if uh, either his injury is uh, worse and uh, it's lingering and they have to make a change or uh, Pat Narduzzi is panicking. One of the I think Pat Narduzzi waved the white flag and is saying, listen, Djokovic can't do nothing for us next year, but Christian Vieira can. Christian Vieira is a redshirt sophomore. So why not see what you have with him? He's a transfer from Penn State. See what he's got. Give him the rest of the year as like a tryout. If that's the route they want to go, if, if you're pretty much waving white white flag on the season, I don't blame them. We saw what Navier had against uh, Carolina's defense, and I wasn't that impressed. Carolina literally said, "We're gonna run the ball three straight plays and punt the ball to you in the whole second half or the whole fourth quarter," and was was not threatened at all. And so, uh, yeah. It'll be interesting. It will definitely be interesting. And, of course, that's going to wrap it up for another edition of the Talking Heels podcast powered to you by Delahanty Media and Keeping It Heel. Of course, check out all our episodes on our YouTube feed, our latest episode with Matt Krauss, the play-by-play -play guy for the women's basketball team. Make sure you check that out. Great insight from Matt as we kick off the start of college basketball season in just over 30 days. It's coming close, but for now, we're going to focus on some football. Until next week. That guy is Jordan Falls, and I'm Nick Delahanty, and this has been the Talking Heels podcast. We'll talk to you guys really soon, and of course, go Heels. Go Heels.